Hey, thanks for joining us today for Movement Church Online. If you don't know me, I'm Chris. I'm the lead pastor here at Movement Church, and we're so excited that we get to worship with you today from our place to your place. And so in a moment, we're going to start singing some songs together, and I want to encourage you, whether you're on your couch or in the kitchen or whenever or wherever we're watching this, join with us in some time of worship and some prayer and a great message from our kids pastor, Devin League. We're going to have a great Sunday together. Let's start now. You've overcome this world with love and made my fight your own. I lift my eyes and throw fear aside and sing out into the night. Cause even when the world pays, even when the fire fire and not be burned pray in the fight and watch it turn jesus tonight i give it all to you Step 
with every heartbeat. Jesus, let it be for you, for you only. My whole life, all for your glory. With every breath, with every word I speak, with every step, with every heartbeat, Jesus, let it be for you, for you only, my whole life, all for your glory, all for your glory. trust it all, I trust it all to you, my dreams and all my plans, trust it all, trust it all, forever I am changed, I'll never be the same, because of your love, because of your love, forever I am changed, I'll never be the same, because of your love, because of you, Jesus, whoa. Because of you, Jesus, whoa, for all my days, God, you are my guide, I give you all, my heart is open wide, Jesus, let it be for you, for you only, my whole life, all for your glory. For your glory, my life is in your hands. I trust it all, trust it all to you. My dreams and all my plans, trust it all, trust it all. Forever I'm changed, I'll never be the same because of your love, because of your love. Forever I'm changed, I'll never be the same. Because of your love, because of you, Jesus. Whoa, because of you, Jesus. Whoa, you are everything, everything you are. All I need, all I need, I am forever in love with you. Forever in love with you are everything, everything you are. All I need, all I need, I am forever in love with you. Forever in love with you are everything, everything you are. All I need, all I need, I am forever in love with you. trust it all, I trust it all to you, my dreams and all my plans, trust it all, trust it all, forever I've changed, I'll never be the same, because of your love, because of your love, forever I've changed, I'll never be the same, because of your love, because of you, Jesus, whoa.
strong and together through faith. God, help us, God. You said in your word that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Lord God, and that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And that your light, the light inside of us, God, is brighter than any light in the universe. God, help us shine in this time, Lord God. Help us be the movement. Help us seek you, God. We love you, and we thank you in your precious son's name. Amen.
Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining us. Now, how are you doing? How's your quarantine going? I hope you're finding a good routine. Uh, I'll be honest, through this whole craziness, through this entire moment that we found ourselves in, my life has not changed all that much. See, before all of this started happening, I already worked from home. And so for me, there would be days, weeks, where I didn't leave the house. There'd be weeks where my car didn't leave the garage. And so the biggest difference for me in this time is that we as a church are no longer able to meet in a physical building at this moment. And I miss it so much. I miss everyone that I get to interact with. Um, but I miss Sunday as a day because Sunday for me was a big day. No matter how much I had left during that week, no matter if I had been in the house the entire week, I knew that on Sunday I got to leave. I got to go somewhere. I got to interact with humans who don't live in my house. But because of that, Sunday also became something of an anchor day for me. Some of you in this moment, you're learning that it's really easy to lose track of what day of the week it is. You think to yourself, what, what day of the week it is? Days no longer matter. So weekdays, they're canceled. There's no such thing as Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday. None of them. They are all gone. Every day is now just called today. That's it. That's all there is. Um, and so Sunday would be that anchor day for me where I would think, you know, how many days has it been since Sunday, since I left the house? And that's how I would figure out what day of the week it was. But I no longer have that. So every day now is just today. But my favorite thing through this moment that I've been able to do is I've been able to spend a little bit more time with my three-year-old daughter, Cece. Before everything went crazy, we would sometimes go out of the house to keep from going stir crazy. We'd go eat lunch at a restaurant or we'd go sit in a coffee shop for a little bit while she drank her lattes. Or we'd go do her favorite thing, which was walk around Target just to see how many new frozen products they have. And the answer is a lot, just an endless supply of new frozen pro products. And that was all good and fun, but we're not able to do those things anymore, or at least would be unwise to do those things now. And so what we've done now to keep from going stir crazy is we'll go for a lot of walks, but a lot of our time is spent in our backyard. And my wife and I have got a lot of different activities set up to keep our daughter busy in the backyard. We play with bubbles, uh, she builds sand castles, uh, sometimes we'll play catch, we make up games. Uh, one of my favorite activities that we do, uh, Cece calls it, let's go play shoot which is uh, where she just watches me get shots up on her little play school hoop and claps for me every time, so she does a lot of time clapping. Uh, and then there's my least favorite activity. She invites me into her toy house, uh, but she doesn't set up any chairs for me or anything like that. It's kind of kind of rude of her, and I just have to sit and crouch down in that tiny house that I do not fit in. But all of these activities, we have a great time. It's a lot of fun, but because she's three, her attention can only be kept for so long and once she's done with an activity, every time comes the question, Dada, what we gonna do now? I think that's a question a lot of us are asking ourselves right now. What are we going to do now? For a lot of us, maybe that's just coming from a place of boredom. I've finished all of Netflix. I've seen every episode of every show on the whole site. What do I do now? You've finished all your work from home activities for the day. What do I do now? Maybe you've eaten all your quarantine snacks. What do I do now? Maybe on the other end of the spectrum, you got a work from home workout in. Amazing job. But what am I going to do now? Other, others of us are asking that question from a more scary place. That, that business is being shut down and everything going crazy right now. Maybe that means that you've lost your job. What am I going to do now? Maybe money's getting tighter for a lot of us and we're uncertain how we're going to pay the bills this month. What? am I going to do now? And over the past few weeks, we've been in the Easter season. We've been celebrating the events around the end of Jesus's life. On Palm Sunday, we celebrated he arrived in Jerusalem, and then we celebrated the, the last activities of his last week, the last supper with his disciples, his betrayal, his trial, and ultimately his crucifixion and his resurrection. And I have been thinking so much about the similarities between the moment that the disciples found themselves in after Jesus' death and resurrection and the moment that we find ourselves in now. For both of us, there was a very clear before moment. I don't know if this was your experience, but for me, all of this seemed to happen overnight. For me, it was just a normal day, a normal Wednesday. I was starting to cook dinner, and I happened to notice on Twitter that a basketball game that I was kind of following was being postponed, that it was delayed. And I was like, that's, that's kind of strange. And then I got a text message from a friend of mine letting me know that he had just found out that sports for the rest of the school year in our district had been canceled. And I was like, oh man, this is getting kind of serious. 
And then I happened to see from another friend on Facebook that they had lost access to the school that their church met in. I was like, oh man, we meet in a school. We might lose access. And sure enough, by the end of that night, the NBA season had been postponed, uh, the stay-at-home orders and, and businesses shutting down, and all of these things began to snowball. And so we were all in a moment of asking ourselves, what are we going to do now? And for the disciples, their moment before, everything was going great. They were seeing amazing things happen. They saw water become wine. They saw dead people become alive. They saw the lake become something that they could walk on. They saw hungry people become full with just a few fish and a few loaves of bread. And so they were part of amazing things happening. The Messiah that their parents and their parents and their parents had been telling them about for their whole lives was here now, and they got to be on the front lines of what he was doing on earth. But just as quickly as he had shown up in their lives, he was gone, brutally, excruciatingly executed. And the disciples, all the excitement that they had was replaced with confusion and this question of what are we going to do now? The noteworthy 12 from before were now the despised 11, where once they were excited to be associated with this revolutionary man, they were now afraid and hiding out, worried about being arrested for being associated with the executed rebel. And so now in the after moment, they were hiding and afraid of what was going to come next. Will things ever be the same again? They weren't sure that it would. And it's in this moment that Jesus begins to appear to them, that their friend that they spent all this time with is now alive, that he didn't stay dead. But everything is different. He's not with them constantly. They're not traveling around like they did before. He shows up and they're able to spend time with their friend and he eats food with them. They can see his wounds and touch his wounds, but everything is different. Everything is weird now. And so for the disciples, they were in a time of uncertainty and confusion and just this unmistakable feeling that things may never be the same again. And I don't know about you, but all of those things apply to my life right now. What's going to happen? I don't know. It's an uncertain moment. It's a confusing moment. But here's the thing about that question that we have for ourselves. What are we going to do next? It is fundamentally a question of plan. It's another way of asking what comes next? What's the next step? What do we do now? And I think an important truth for us to begin to understand this morning is that Jesus's answer to what comes next isn't a plan, but it's actually his presence. The disciples were in a moment where they wanted to plan. They wanted to know what comes next. And in that confusion, in that uncertainty, Jesus didn't give them a plan. He gave them his presence. If you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be in John chapter 21. We're going to be in verses 1 through 12. This is the absolute last chapter of the four Gospels. You turn the page, you're in Acts, in the beginning of the early church, and all that excitement, and all the things that we looked at in our last series, Bold. But this is the last chapter of John. And so let's see how he closes out the four Gospels. It says this in verse 1. Later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. And this is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there. Simon Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. Our story starts off by letting us know that this isn't Jesus' first appearance to the disciples after his resurrection. It says that Jesus appeared to them again. See, for me, I think all the other appearances of Jesus were a bit more exciting for the disciples. This one doesn't seem as exciting. In the first few, there's that excitement that this man that they were so close to, that they spent three years of their life traveling around with, is back. They were grieving this man. They were devastated by losing him, by his death. They were sad. They were going through the grieving process. And then now he is back. Our friend is back. And that is exciting. But there's also the just absolute shock of we saw this man die. We saw this man be murdered. And now we see this man with us. We can touch his wounds. He is with us in this room. He's eating food. He is with us. But there's also like post-resurrection glow and learning that, you know, he's doing cool things still. Death didn't keep him from doing cool things. He can show up in a room that we were locked in. There's no way he could have just opened the door. He shows up in this room. So there's all of that excitement in the first few appearances, but this one is different. The disciples are just hanging out on the shore, unsure of what they should be doing. And so they're just hanging out. And then there's Peter 
always the first one to take action, who says, I'm going fishing. And we see that the disciples are all too eager to go, follow his lead, to go with him, to jump at the opportunity. And that kind of feels like the moment that a lot of us are probably in in our quarantine, right? I know me personally, any, any mention of activity in my house, and I am all in. Someone's going to go check the mail. Let's all go. It'll be a fun family outing. Someone says, oh, I forgot something in the closet. I'm in. Let's go. Can I join you? I'll go with you to the closet. I'll walk around the house, even though we're not going outside. The slightest mention of activity, I get excited about. And that's what this moment kind of feels like. But when we look a little bit closer, what I actually think Peter is saying is that he's actually returning to his job. That he's not just saying, I'm going to go past the time by fishing. He's saying, I'm returning to being a fisherman. Which makes sense. Before, a few years earlier, when Jesus showed up on a lake like this, all of these disciples were fishermen. It's what they did for a living. And give, so it makes sense that in this moment of uncertainty, in this moment of confusion and not knowing what's going to come next for them, it makes sense that the disciples would return to what they knew. But also, this appearance is over a week after Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And so some time has passed, and it's entirely likely that the disciples were feeling some financial pressure. It's possible that they had bills to pay. Some of them had families to support. And so they returned to fishing to make some money, return to what they knew. But they catch nothing all night. In fact, it's worse than that. It says that, that they caught nothing all night. They're catching fish all night. And so just imagine the frustration that would come with that. These are fishermen by trade. This is what they do for a living. They should be good at this, and yet they're struggling, fishing all night and seeing no results for their hard work. But in verse 4, things begin to change. It says, At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. He called out, Fellows or children, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Now, verse 4 pops out at me. It says that Jesus showed up at dawn on the beach. If you remember from the first appearances of Jesus, we learned that he can show up anywhere. In the first appearance to his disciples, they were in a locked room. They had the doors locked, and Jesus shows up in the room with them. Another appearance, there's two followers of Jesus who are walking away from Jerusalem, or walking away from everything that happened over the last few days, and Jesus shows up on that road with them. And so we know that Jesus could show up anywhere. It certainly would have been possible for Jesus to show up in the middle of the night in the boat with the disciples. And yet it tells us that he showed up at dawn on the beach. And what I think that means for us is that Jesus's activity may be unpredictable, but his presence is always reliable. See, how often do we expect that Jesus's help will show up exactly how we imagine it should? We want him to show up on our terms. We want his help to look exactly how we imagine it in our heads. And yet, it doesn't. We want it to show up on our schedule. We want it to show up according to our plan. And yet, a lot of times, Jesus' presence shows up in ways that we never could have imagined. I'm sure the disciples would have preferred for Jesus to show up way earlier, like, you know, maybe an hour or two after they didn't catch any fish. And yet, Jesus' presence looks a lot different than the way they probably would have preferred. And so that day, the disciples learned a reaffirming truth for, for, that can bring comfort to us as well. That even if Jesus' presence doesn't look the way that we think it should, even if his presence doesn't show up when we think it should, it always shows up. Let's keep going in our story with verse 6. It says, Then he said, Throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you'll get some. So they did, and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. See, all through that night, the disciples had been fishing their way. They had been doing things their way. And then Jesus shows up and suggests a change of course. Now, this is what these guys do for a living. So they're frustrated. They're not catching any fish. This is what we do for a living. We should be good at this. And at this point in the story, they also don't recognize Jesus. As far as they know, this is just some random stranger on the shore yelling out fishing tips. And I don't know if they're as sarcastic as me or would be as cranky as I would be in that situation, but I imagine I would not be very happy to hear this advice. I would not take this advice very well. Like, really, guy, you're just going to yell out, try the right side of the, the boat? I imagine after a night of fishing, they've tried every boat, every side of the boat possible, that they've tried the right, they've tried the left, they've tried the back and the front. They've tried everything they can. They've not caught any fish all night. And then there's Bass Pro Shop over here yelling out, to try the right side, like we haven't tried that 
already. But yet it tells us that they tried it. They do it anyways, likely out of desperation more than anything else, but they try it and it works, which leads to our next observation that Jesus's presence can do for us what we can't do on our own. Now that sounds pretty obvious. Of course, God can do what we can. Of course, God, we believe he's all powerful. We believe he is strong and all of those things. And so of course he can do what we can. But how often do we live as if we didn't know that this was true? We're not the only ones who live that way. The disciples had worked hard all night to try and catch fish, and yet they were unable to catch a single one. And then Jesus shows up on the scene, gives them a one-sentence suggestion, and they catch so many fish that seven full-grown men couldn't pull it into the boat. This contrast is so hilarious to me, mostly because I so recognize it in my own life, and maybe you do too. We try to do things on our own. We try to do things on our own strength. We try and struggle and do all of these things, and we try to do it on our own, and yet nothing. And what the disciples' experience shows us is that that won't work. It's only when Jesus is in the process that we will find success. We can work and work all through the night. We can exhaust ourselves when all we really need to do is change our approach. All we really need to do is be open to God's power and God's presence in our life to do more than we could do on our own. Let's finish the rest of the story, picking up in verse 7. It says, Then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he had stripped for work, jumped into the water, and headed to the shore, for they were only about a hundred yards from the shore. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over a charcoal fire, and some bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to the shore. There were 153 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. Now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. So finally, after a night of struggle and a quick experience with Jesus, the disciples have a bunch of fish. It's a miracle. This is a great development, but it also presents the new challenge of they have to figure out how to get these fish back to the shore. They aren't able to get it actually into the boat, so they decide they're going to drag the net behind the boat. And this is where all of the pieces start to click together for the disciples. They're realizing, wow, this is a lot more fish than we normally catch. This is just an overwhelming haul that we've got here. And that figure that we see on the shore, we're not that far. We're starting to be able to make it out. That kind of looks like Jesus. And the author of John, John himself, is the one who recognizes it's the Lord. And so he says that out loud. Peter, it starts to dawn on him, and in peak Peter behavior, just jumps out of the boat and swims to the shore, Forrest Gump style. And so they all get to the shore. He leaves the disciples. The rest of them drag this huge paycheck to the shore. And when they get back to the shore, they notice something curious. They've just caught what is specified as 153 exactly large fish. And yet, when they get to the shore, they see that Jesus is already cooking some fish and bread for their breakfast. This is where we find our last observation, that Jesus' presence meets the needs that we neglect. See, in the larger scheme of the season that the disciples were in, they needed these fish for a paycheck. They needed the money. And so Jesus shows up and meets this big need in a big way. But they also needed breakfast. They had been up all night, struggling, trying to catch fish, getting frustrated and frustrated and getting worse and worse. And so they had gone through all of this emotional energy, put out all of this physical energy, and been up all night. And so they simply needed breakfast. And so Jesus meets that need also. And I think that we're a lot like the disciples in that we recognize the big needs that we have in the larger seasons of our life, but sometimes we often tend to neglect the smaller needs in the moment. See, maybe for us in this season, we recognize our big needs. Maybe our big need is for a job, or maybe our big need is for some wisdom and some guidance and a big decision that we have to make. Or maybe our big need in this moment is is healing for a loved one or for ourselves. Maybe this pandemic has, has touched us personally in a way that others of us haven't experienced. And those are all big needs, and Jesus cares about our big needs. He meets our big needs. But there's also smaller needs that we need. There's needs in our season, but there's also needs that we forget in the moment. See, there's a reason that Jesus included in when he taught the disciples how to pray. There's a reason he included, give us this day our daily bread. The needs of the moment are also important for us, and they're important to 
Jesus. Maybe for you, the need in this moment is you need to have the ability to have grace for yourself. You haven't met your quarantine goals. You haven't accomplished what you hope to, and you need to be able to give yourself that grace. Maybe for you, it's just you need peace. All the uncertainty, all the anxiety, all the things that are going on and all the uncertainty, you're not sure what's going to come next, and you just need the peace of Jesus in this moment. Maybe for you, what you need is patience with your spouse. You're sick of being cooped up in the house. You're getting on each other's nerves constantly, and you need to have patience with each other. Maybe for you, it's patience with your children who are also sick of being cooped up in the house and are, have all this energy and, and no way to really get rid of it. Maybe you need patience in that, or maybe just the need in this moment for you is you just need a really good breakfast. No matter what the need is, Jesus cares about the larger needs of our season, but he also cares about the smaller needs in each moment. So for the disciples, in the time that they were facing, in the season that they were going through, before Jesus showed up, they weren't sure what was going to come next. They were confused. They were scared. They felt like their lives were on hold which is a lot how a lot of us feel right now. The similarities between their moment and our moment are undeniable. And what we both crave in the face of uncertainty is a plan. What we crave is answers. We want to know what comes next. We want to know when will things be able to go back to normal? Will everything be okay? Will we make it through this? What is the plan? What is the next step? And what we learned is that Jesus isn't always as interested in giving us a plan as he is in giving us his presence. See, a plan feels comforting to us. A plan is something that we can control. A plan is something that we can predict. And what we've seen through the disciple story is that Jesus' presence is completely unpredictable. We don't know when it'll show up. We can't control it. But what we can do is we can rely on it. We can trust that even if it doesn't look the way that we expect it will, Jesus' presence will be there. Jesus will be with us through whatever it is that we face. We can trust that he will show up even if it's not how we expect. And as comforting as a plan feels to us, what we also learn through the disciples is that plans can fail, that our plans often do fail, that we can stay up all night, we can struggle and fight and put in all the effort that we have. But if Jesus is not part of that process, we won't find success. And so Jesus shows up in the presence, in, the, in, in our struggle, and meets the needs that we neglect. And lastly, as much as we plan what we think we need, we often aren't even aware of the needs that we have. We overlook the needs of the moment, and Jesus' presence meets our needs, meets us where we are, and meets the needs that we have going on. So if Jesus' answer to what comes next isn't a plan, but is his presence, the question for us this morning becomes, how can we encounter the presence of Jesus in this season? And so to close this morning, I want to suggest three practices that will help us experience the presence of Jesus through the uncertainty of this moment. First, our eyes are open to Jesus' presence through prayer. I think often we approach prayer as a way to present our problems to God. That we have our list of needs and we read them to him and expect him to show up in a certain way. And Jesus does care about our needs. He does want us to bring our needs to him. But prayer is primarily not about a to-do list. Prayer is an encounter with God. It's talking with God more than it is talking to God. And so the goal of prayer shouldn't be to have our needs met. The goal of prayer is to experience God's presence and make space for him to move in our lives in any way that he sees fit. A way that I've gone about this that I found incredibly helpful is a, a breathing exercise prayer called breath prayer. And all you do, it sounds a little weird, but it's simply a tool. And if it's too weird and it's a tool, leave it to the side. But if it helps you, all you do is you take a deep breath in and then you breathe out while thinking the line of a prayer or a line of scripture. And so the most popular one is called the Jesus prayer. On the inhale, you breathe and you think, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, and then on the exhale, have mercy on me, a sinner. I've been using Colossians 3, verse 15, where on the inhale, I think, uh, allow the peace of Christ to rule in your bodies, and on the exhale, as members of one body, you are called to peace. And so this is just a way that I'm able to slow down and be present in the moment and allow myself to be aware of the reality that Jesus is present in that moment, and Jesus is in control of every 
moment. And when I first started, it was really weird. I get it. I am there with you. The overwhelming weirdness of it and the distractions at first made me not want to do it at all. But as I pushed past distractions, as I pushed past the weirdness, I was able to realize that Jesus is with me in that moment. It made his presence real to me. So if that's something you want to try that'll help you experience Jesus's presence through this moment, that would be something that I encourage. Second, our lives are changed through the reading of scripture. The number one tool in the life of a follower of Jesus that can change and challenge the way that we currently live is God's word. Page after page, it confronts our worldviews, our biases, our desires, everything about the way that we live, and instead challenges us to live our lives in the way of Jesus. And so reading the Bible is a lifelong practice. I think we get this idea that the goal is to be perfect, that the goal is to be a Bible scholar, but I've been reading the Bible my entire life. I have went to Bible college. I've read all the way through it numerous times over 20-ish years, and there are still things in the Bible that I don't understand. And there's things that I think I understand that I probably am not understanding correctly or fully. And so the goal is not perfection. The goal is to engage with the text at a deeper level and to allow it to confront us and to allow it to change the way that we live our lives. Lastly, our souls are refreshed through the practice of Sabbath. Now, Sabbath doesn't mean binging Tiger King all day and playing video games and sleeping as late as you possibly can. Sabbath is more than just a day off. John Mark Comer defines Sabbath this way, that Sabbath is a 24-hour time period of restful worship by which we cultivate a restful spirit in all of our life. And it might seem counterproductive to practice Sabbath right now, where a lot of us are experiencing something of a forced Sabbath. But I think now is the perfect time for us to begin or to continue practicing Sabbath. See, we need that time to disconnect from what robs us of our rest, what robs us of our peace, the constant barrage of news. We need that time to disconnect from that and enter in instead into what brings us rest and what leads us to worship our creator. We need this time, this pattern, this rhythm to disconnect from our screens, from distraction, from the news, and instead practice what brings us rest, what helps us experience the presence of God in a more real way, intentional time with our family of whatever hobby we enjoy, the good things that God has given us in our life, a time to disconnect what robs us of that rest and enter into a time of worship of our Heavenly Father. And so the question that we've been asking ourselves this whole time, what are we going to do now? And the answer isn't a plan, the answer isn't another step or what comes next, the answer is the presence of Jesus. And we can experience that presence through prayer, through engaging in the scriptures, and by practicing Sabbath. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for the truth that even in this moment, no matter what we're going through, through all of the uncertainty, you are with us and you care about what we are facing. And so as we go through this quarantine and all of the things that we are facing in this moment, I pray that you would help us to experience your presence in a very real way, that you would help us enter into prayer find ways to make intentional time to pray and experience your presence. I pray that you would help us to engage scripture deeper than we ever have, to use whatever extra time we have found to engage with scripture and learn more about your word. And I pray that you would help us to begin a rhythm and a practice of Sabbath where we can enter into your rest and find the rest that you have for our souls. We thank you that you are with us through whatever we face and that you care about every need that we have. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, I wanted to say thanks one more time for joining us today for Movement Church Online from wherever you are to here in our place. We're so thankful that we were able to get together and worship together today. I want to let you know a couple of things. If you're a parent, again, we want to draw your attention to Facebook and YouTube because our kids' experiences are live right now. And on Facebook, there's some activity and discussion guides so that you can keep your kids growing and learning during this 
time. Secondly, if you have a need, we want to know your need so that we can be part of maybe meeting your need in this time. So we have a phone number on screen that you can call or send a message to, or we have an email address on screen that you can send an email to to let us know your need so that hopefully we can meet your need during this time. And then finally, if you want to give today, we just want to say thank you so much for your generosity. We know right now is a stretching time for all of us, and we want to thank you that in this stretching time that you're staying obedient and faithful to God and generous towards the church. So thank you so much for doing that. The ways that you can give are listed on the screen right now, and we just want to say thank you so much. So again, thanks so much for joining us today for Movement Church Online. Hope you have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday as I begin a new series called easy to say. A lot of things are easy to say, but hard to believe and harder to live out. And we're going to talk about those things. So we'll see you next week. Have a great day.